Welcome to the chapter 13 uh, lecture on DNA and uh, DNA replication. So first off, we're going to talk about DNA structure. What makes up DNA? What does DNA look like? So DNA is commonly found in the... That's what we're going to see in the double helix form. Okay, that's how DNA is is uh, wound up in each of our chromosomes. It's in that double helix form in order to protect the material um, that codes for who we are, um, for who each organism is. Uh, DNA has a variety of functions, you know, besides storing the information that uh, codes for everything about us. They direct the synthesis of proteins, which we're going to learn about in Chapter 14. Um, they, it can uh, be involved in the change of characteristics for future generations. Um, and the DNA goes through replication, which is what we're going to look at uh, here next. So when we're looking at the DNA structure here, let's say we blow this up and we look at the actual structure. DNA is built off of a sequence of nucleotides. Remember, nucleotides are the building block of DNA. So each one of these strands, okay, we have strand one here and strand two there. Each one of those strands is made up of nucleotides. Now what's... Um, a nucleotide. So if we think back to chapter 3, a nucleotide is a sugar and a phosphate, and they're linked by a covalent bond. So here's our phosphate group. Alright, and here is our, actually let me, I'll just leave it a P there. So there's our phosphate group, and then the sugar is actually deoxyribose for DNA. Deoxyribose. Okay? And that's an O. Deoxy. Deoxyribose. That's the sugar. Okay? Deoxyribose. And that's part of the name. Deoxyribose nucleic acid. So a phosphate and a sugar. And then coming off of that, you have a base. We call it a nitrogenous base or nitrogen containing base because nitrogen is part of it. And these bases are what allows the two DNA complexes to stay together or the two DNA strands to stay together in the double helix formation. Okay. And so this, if we were looking at the whole strand here, this sugar would then be bound with another phosphate here through a covalent bond. Then you have your sugar here, and that would continue all along the backbone um, of the DNA. And then in the middle here, you would have your uh, nitrogenous bases. Now, there's four types of bases. There's, let me clear this page here, clearing. There's adenine. Adenine pairs with thymine. So A, you'll see a lot of times, pairs with T. So A pairs with T. Okay. And then there's guanine. And guanine pairs with cytosine. So C pairs with G. Okay, so you'll see that um, on the DNA strand. For example, if we're looking at... A DNA strand, and I was just showing you the bases, and let's say one strand was A, G, C, T, A, C, G, T. The opposite strand would be what we call complementary base pairs, okay? So if A pairs with T, the other strand is going to be T. And actually, let me do it in a different color here. T. G pairs with C, so that's complementary base is C. C's complementary base is G. T is A, and then T and G and C and A. And then the, that allows the double helix to uh, stay together. And, and the way that is is it's through these hydrogen bonds between the bases. The bases actually hydrogen bond together and hold the two strands together. For example, if we have one strand here, if these are the strands we just looked at, there are hydrogen bonds between them here. And that holds the strands together and it's all because of these bases that come off of the nucleotides and that's what makes up our DNA now these bases these codes right here that we're looking at 
they'll also code also code for the proteins um, and protein production that we're going to talk about in uh, chapter 14. Okay, so that's a basic look at DNA structure. Okay, and then we talked a little bit about function as well. All right, next we're going to look at DNA replication. So DNA replication is pretty neat. So if we have our two DNA strands here, when we divide our cells, right, before we go into cell division at any time, we go through DNA replication. We learned that in Chapter uh, 9 and 10, right? We always go through DNA replication before the cell divides. So how does it do that? Well, we, first we have some enzymes that come in, and I'll show you some better pictures here in a minute. But we have two different enzymes that come in, helicase and DNA polymerase. Let's just look at the names first to figure out what their function is. Remember, double helix, right? DNA is in a double helix. Well, here we have heli, helic ace. Okay, ace is what refers to the enzyme part of it, right? It says, hey, this is an enzyme. And then you have this part here that refers to the double helix. So this enzyme actually breaks apart the double helix. Okay, it breaks apart the double helix. Now the other one here, DNA polymerase, again you have the ACE that refers to enzymes. You have DNA which refers to the molecule it works on. And then here you have this term called polymer, which we learned back in chapter 3 as well. Polymer is a a molecule built out of smaller units. It's a long uh, or large molecule. And the DNA polymerase is an enzyme that builds DNA polymers. It builds large DNA molecules. So DNA polymerase actually comes in and builds the new DNA. Okay, it actually comes in and builds the new DNA. All right, so those two enzymes are going to be at work during DNA replication. Now the neat thing about these enzymes is they're very efficient, okay? You're going to have multiple helicase enzymes coming in and opening the DNA strand up, and you're going to have multiple um, DNA polymerase enzymes coming in and replicating along the DNA strand. There's going to be multiple sites of origination or multiple sites of um, replication where they start. So you're going to have more than one DNA polymerase actually working on the same DNA strand, and then they just meet together. And it's very efficient. There's very few errors made. Um, for example, DNA polymerase only makes about an incorrect, puts the wrong base in, one in a billion. Okay, is there an error? Because it can repair. If, even if it notices it does put the wrong one in, it can go back and switch it. It'll actually repair them. It, it is the, the, this, DNA polymerase is the enzyme that actually binds all those nucleotides together. Very efficient. Um, it binds about 50 nucleotides a second, so it's very fast as well. Okay, very fast as well. So let's go ahead and look at a better picture here. So this is a picture of, a very specific picture of how DNA replication would occur. And what would happen is helicase, the enzyme helicase would come in and split the DNA molecule in half. So you have strand one over here and strand two over here of your double helix. And again, notice the base pairs. Here's C, here's G. Here's A, here's T. They bond with each other. That's why they look like puzzle pieces on here so that you can see how they fit. Okay. And then once you split them, you have to replicate the DNA. So what happens is your DNA polymerases, and actually let me put this in black so that we stay consistent here. Your DNA polymerase, and it is because there's more than one, they come in and they actually link the new, new nucleotides together. They put the new nucleotides together. So all this right here, they link those together. As, they, as the nucleotide comes in that's supposed to match the DNA strand, DNA polymerase links them. So, for example, if the DNA strand was A, G, C, T, and we needed to replicate, we would bring in the base pairs. So T would come in, C would come in, G would come in, A would come in, and DNA polymerase would link these all together to make a new DNA strand. Now, once we do this complementary base pairing, 
these molecules stay together. So the new one, so one new one, and then the original one stay together. So you'll end up with one new one with each with each original strand, as you can see in this picture. If I um, clear the ink here, here's our original, here's our original, here's an original, here's an original, here's an original, here's original, and then here's a new strand, here's a new strand. So instead of making a complete new copy and setting it on setting it on its own, we just divide each strand up and pair it with new bases and create two new. So there's one and there's two, two new DNA molecules. And that's how we do DNA replication. Now again, make sure you know helicase unwinds the helix, the DNA, and I'll just shorthand this, DNA polyase links the nucleotides. And again, there's more than one DNA polymerase, and they start all along the DNA strand as well as helicase, and they meet, they work together to... Um, and uh, meet together to create the DNA strain. And as the DNA polymerase goes, they rewind behind um, the enzyme. They rewind up into the double helix. This next picture shows the uh, how DNA replication works in a little better, in a larger view. Shows the a larger DNA molecule here, and you can see how the new strand, this white one, stays with the original strand on each side here. Okay, and you can see how we open this up. And then the DNA polymerase would just move along and add the new nucleotides. And you would end up with two new DNA molecules. So if you started with your DNA molecule, I'll draw a better one than that. If you started with your DNA molecule here, you would end up with this. Your original and your old and your original and your new, just like that. So you would have one, two new DNA molecules, but there's an original in each DNA, DNA molecule. And again, there's very few errors, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. We're very efficient, and you gotta make sure you remember those two enzymes as well. All right, let's talk about replication errors. So as that, let's say we have a, G, C, T, T, G, C, G. As DNA polymerase, so I'm just going to put DNA ace here, moves along and adds new nucleotides in. So here we would have T, and here we'd have C, and here we have G. Now all of a sudden, actually, what if we get that put in? And then C, and then C, oops, or A, and then C, and then G, and then C. You get the wrong base put in there. Okay? That's a replication error when you get the wrong base put in. Alright? You can have this error. Now a lot of times DNA polymerase can come back and fix that and put the right one in. But even then, it can still happen. It can it can miss it. And that's about a one in a billion chance, but it can miss it and you get the wrong base put into the DNA molecule. And this is what we call a mutation. A mutation. Alright, a mutation can can cause issues. It can also you you may get a mutation and never know it. And it can also cause good things. Sometimes that's what's caused a lot of the evolutionary changes um, in organisms. Um, a lot of the new things you see a lot of times are mutations. Um, and by new things I mean could be uh, any type of physical characteristic you might see in any organism could be caused by mutation. A lot of disorders we see are caused by mutations, like cancer, uh, specifically melanoma in the skin, is caused by a mutation. So let's look at the different types of mutations. The first one is a base substitution, or what we also call point mutation. And what this is, is basically where if I'm A, G, C, T, A, T, G, it's where the new strand gets a, basically we substitute a base. We change the base. Um, instead of what it should be, it becomes something else. You just change one base. So if this was T, this was C, and if this became A, this would be your base substitution. And that's a mutation. Okay, and that's a mutation. Now there's few different types of base substitutions. The first one's being silent, a silent mutation. Silent 
mutation is there's no change. So down the road, and we'll you'll, this will make more sense when we get into chapter 13, uh, 14, but there's no change. Um, it codes for the same amino acid. So it'll code for the same, and I'll shorthand it, or I'll write it out, same amino acid. Okay. So a silent mutation, there's no change. You wouldn't notice it. It codes for the same amino acid. And a mutation occurred, but you don't know. We don't know. We can't tell. So that's the first one. The second base substitution or point mutation is a missense. A missense mutation. And this is where it actually does cause a change, and a lot of times it's an adverse change. For the most part, most mutations do cause negative um, effects. And the reason it is adverse is because it causes a different, and I can't spell here, a different... Amino acid, I'll just abbreviate that a, a different amino acid. So when you go to make a protein, if you had a missense mutation, it would cause a different amino acid when you're making that protein, and that may make a protein unfunctionable. Okay, it would become in non functional in your body, which could cause um, adverse effects in your body. For example, sickle cell um, anemia, where your blood cells take on a a disorder shape. That is a example of a missense mutation. It causes your blood cells instead of to be look like a donut, they look more like a uh, almost like a U, and that can cause poor clotting. It can also cause um, clotting on like cuts, but it can also cause uh, blood clots within the vessels because um, they get all bound up in your blood vessels. And the third one is nonsense mutation. A nonsense mutation is where it still causes a change, but what it does is it causes what we call a stop codon. So when we're going to make a protein, and again, this will make more sense in chapter 14, when we're going to make a protein, when it gets to this section, it tells the body to quit making the protein, to stop, that's the end of the protein. So a lot of times you get a incomplete protein, and so therefore it, can't, it won't be functional. And again, that will have an adverse effect on the uh, body. The last type of mutation we're going to talk about is a frame shift mutation, which is a deletion or an insertion. So if we had, if this was the original strain here, A, G, C, T, A, G, C, T. And when we're going through, this becomes, so we have T, C, G, A. And now all of a sudden we insert G and C in here, and then, T and C and G and A. So you get this new set of nucleotides in there. That would be an insertion. If we just deleted one here, if we deleted A and T, so if I'll do this here. Let me, oops. If I, so if this wasn't here, and then we just deleted that one, that would be a deletion. And what happens is it causes the whole DNA complex to shift one way or another. Either you're adding one and it'll change all the amino acids, possibly, or you're deleting one, which could also change the amino acids uh, for protein production. Okay, so those are the those are your types of mutations we're going to talk about, either a point mutation or a frame shift mutation. Okay, and there's a lot of things, sometimes our bodies can just do that, but there's also a lot of things that can cause mutations, like uh, any, a lot of mutagens like x-rays, UV rays, radiation, things we eat. Um, those kind of things can all cause mutations. And that's actually how UV rays cause melanoma. Is It actually hits a cell at the right time and actually causes a mutation in, the, in a certain gene that causes um, that, gene, that uh, cell to become cancerous and divide uh, like crazy and, be, and it becomes melanoma. All because of UV light causing a mutation during DNA replication. So, um, mutations are generally harmful, but they can have, an, they can have some enhancements, um, or they may never be seen. Just depends on what type of mutation it is. All right, that's the end of Chapter 13. Make sure you listen to Chapter 14 lecture as well on transcription translation, because that will make a lot of the ending part of this uh, chapter make more sense.